Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter, the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program, as many of you know, is part of a series of programs that we started uh, a year ago about different objects in our collection and as a way to draw attention to those objects when our building was closed. Now our building is open. I encourage people to come and see these objects in person, but we continue to hold these online programs as a way to draw attention still to those items in our collection. As always, let me encourage you to pose any questions you have during the program using the Q&A function of Zoom, and I will do my best to respond as your questions come up or at the end of the program. Today, I'm going to talk about a watercolor painting that hangs in our children's gallery. The painting was made by Marietta Grunbaum while she and her family were interred in the Nazi camp of Theresienstadt near Prague. Before I talk more about Marietta, let me put in a special thanks to her brother, Michael Grunbaum, and to one of the curators at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, Judith Cohen both of whom were generous in sharing information about this painting and the family with me before my program. Here's the caption underneath the painting that we include in our gallery. Marietta Grunbaum was a teenager in Theresien, where she painted this watercolor in 1943. She and her mother and her younger brother spent two and a half years in the camp. Miraculously, all three survived. Let me begin by giving some background about this family. Marietta Grunbaum was born in Prague on July 24th, 1926, the daughter of Carol and Margaret Grunbaum. Marietta's brother, Michael, was born four years later in 1930. This picture shows both of the children in 1933, a lovely photograph. Carol, Marietta's father, was a successful attorney, enabling the family to live in a large apartment in an elevator building and to purchase their own automobile, which was parked in a garage just a couple of blocks from their home in Prague. Prague in 1930 was home to a small but flourishing Jewish community of about 35,000 people in the larger city of 850,000. After 1933, when Hitler and the Nazi party gained power in Germany, the city saw an influx of German Jews who fled from Germany, raising the city's Jewish population to around 56 or 60,000, but the Jewish population remained only a little over 5% of the city's residents. The thriving Jewish community became a major target, however, in 1938, when Hitler turned his expansionist eyes towards Czechoslovakia. Hitler's uh, interest was initially only about the portion of Czechoslovakia closest to Germany, known as the Sudetenland, which had been carved out of the defeated Austria-Hungarian Empire after World War I and incorporated into the newly created nation of Czechoslovakia. When the lines were drawn after World War I, more than three million Germans, representing about a fifth of the new Czech population, were included in the new nation of Czechoslovakia. Here's an ethno-linguistic map from 1937. The green areas are where German is the predominant language. And you can see at least linguistically, Austria was a good fit to merge with Germany, which happened in the early part of 1938. And you can see that the northern portion of Czechoslovakia shared that common language with the Germans across the border rather than with their fellow countrymen. As early as 1933, Germans in the Sudetenland created a political party that advocated for the autonomy of that region from Czechoslovakia. And over the next five years, their calls became louder and Hitler increased his support for them. By August of 1938, Hitler had moved troops to the Czech border and threatened war. It was in that atmosphere that Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, the French Prime Minister, Edward de Ladier and the Prime Minister of Italy, Benito Mussolini, began discussions and shuttle diplomacy with Hitler to try and avoid war. Notably absent from those discussions was any representation from Czechoslovakia itself. When the final agreement, known as the Munich Agreement, was reached on September 30th, 1938, there was similarly no Czechoslovakian signature. The other countries largely agreed to Hitler's demands, 
allowing Nazi Germany to occupy the Sudetenland by October 10th and set an international commission to explore the breaking up of other parts of Czechoslovakia. Less than six months later, the rest of Czechoslovakia got divided up with the Nazis claiming much of the territory, including Prague, as part of the newly formed protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. Marietta's father was actually in England when the Nazis invaded in 1939, and he could have chosen to stay there in safety, but instead he returned to Czechoslovakia to be with his family to try and help them. Like in other German occupied territories, the Nazis quickly imposed a series of limitations and restrictions on the Grunbaums and the rest of the Jewish population of Prague. They were forced to register their names and provide a list of their assets. assets. Carol was forced to resign from his job. The family was required to wear a yellow star whenever they went outside, just to make sure that everybody could see they were Jews. Their home, their car, and most of their possessions were then confiscated, and they were forced into a much smaller apartment. After two years of surviving under worsening and worsening conditions, Carol was arrested by the Gestapo in, August, in October of 1941. He was then interrogated and sent to the small fortress, a military fortification that the Nazis had converted into a prison near the walled city of Theresien. Shortly after arriving there, he was murdered. Marietta, her brother and her mother remained in Prague for another year before they were also deported to Theresa, not to the small fortress, not to the prison, but to the walled city itself, which had by then been converted into a Jewish ghetto and forced and to do forced labor in the camp that the Nazis renamed Theresienstadt. The decision to make Theresa into a ghetto and a camp was formalized nine months before Marietta, Michael, and Margaret received their deportation orders at a meeting held in a villa in Vance on the outskirts of Berlin in January of 1942. At the Vance conference, Reinhard Heydrich, one of the most powerful figures in the Nazi hierarchy, had gotten broad agreement from the departments of the Nazi state about the implementation of the mass murder of Jews in Europe. But in that agreement, it was decided that German Jews, particularly those with friends in high places or who had been who had served with distinction during World War I for the German army, or whose disappearance might be problematic in any of a number of different ways, that those Jews, rather than be deported to the East, should be sent to Theresienstadt. While saved from immediate death, deportation to Theresienstadt was hardly a longer savings. Uh, most of the Jews who were sent there were murdered. The German Jews crowded into dormitories in Theresienstadt with minimal concern for hygiene, and then were forced into a starvation diet by the strict limitation on the amount of food that was brought into the ghetto or into the camp. By the time the Grunbaums arrived in Theresienstadt in November of 1942, more than 53,000 Jews had been sent to live in the town, which had been home to only 8,000 residents just a year earlier. It's hard to imagine the overcrowding. Eight, room for 8,000, housing 53,000, or 50, yeah, 53,000. During the next 18 months, regular deportations took Jews from Theresienstadt north and east to Nazi killing centers and other camps in Poland. Meanwhile, more Jews were brought into Theresienstadt from Germany and other areas to the south and west. Mass deportations to Theresienstadt finally ended in the middle of 1943. By then, the crowded conditions had eased, but only because of the combination of high death rates and the outward deportations to Auschwitz and other killing centers. In June of 1944, when international pressure finally pushed the Nazis to allow the Red Cross to come and inspect Theresienstadt, the combination of starvation, disease, and deportations to killing centers made it possible for the Nazis to make it appear as if Theresienstadt was a model ghetto. And the Red Cross inspectors bought the lie hook, line, and sinker, enabling, enabling Hitler to sustain the falsehood that he was simply resettling the Jews, not murdering them. 
with the Red Cross visit over, of course, the deportations to killing centers from Theresienstadt restarted. And by the end of October 1944, only 11,000 residents remained in Theresienstadt. In all, about 140,000 Jews were transferred to Theresienstadt between 1941 and 1944, nearly 90,000 of whom were deported to points further east and almost all went to certain death. Roughly 33,000 residents died in Theresienstadt itself. Marietta, Michael, and their mother, Margaret, all miraculously sur survived, as our caption says on the painting. Marietta's aunt, who came to Theresienstadt with Marietta, did not survive. She was included in one of the early deportations out from Theresienstadt, but made an arrangement with her sister, with Marietta's mother, that if she could send a letter back, she would include a code to give some information about what she was experiencing. If her letter, if her letter was written with an upward slant to the words, then that would mean all was well wherever she had been deported to. If on the other hand, the letters slanted down, then that was a sign that things were not well and that Marietta's aunt would be in trouble. Shortly after her sister-in-law was deported, Marietta's mother received this letter from her. And you'll note the slight downward slant of the words. It's not blatantly obvious because of concerns about the people who'd be reading this letter, the, uh, the censors, but she was trying to send a signal that deportation from Theresienstadt was not for the better. It must have been a very difficult letter for Marietta's mother to read. First, because Margaret would have known that her sister-in-law was now in trouble. And second, because she must have then realized that the hell she was living through in Theresienstadt with her children was actually better than any other option. I'll add that we have a collection of postcards from Theresienstadt in our museum, which may well include coded messages like the one arranged by Margaret and her sister-in-law. But unlike in Margaret's situation, we don't have the answer key. We don't know what the postcards might, what the secret messages might be in our postcards. We know that it's likely that there were co codes of some sort included in the texts uh, that only the recipients and not the German censors would understand. For Margaret, the knowledge that deportation meant something worse was crucially important information, which she was able to use later to save her and her children. This picture shows Marietta, Michael, and Michael and the family at a gathering with some friends a year before the Nazis invaded Prague and four years before Marietta and her brother were sent to Theresienstadt. Michael stands in the front where his father is seated to his right wearing the light colored fedora. Marietta is in the back on the left side of the table with her arm around her mother. The photograph captures the family at a moment of joy, unaware of the terror that would follow in the months ahead. Once in the ghetto, all three of the surviving members of the family, Marietta, her mother, and her brother, Michael, were forced to do slave labor. Marietta, who had turned 16 a few months before they arrived in Theresienstadt, worked in the camp laundry. Michael, who came to the camp at 12 years old, was placed in a dormitory, so not living with his mother or sister, but placed in a dormitory with other young boys and worked in the garden or later as a delivery boy for a bakery. And Margaret worked in the arts department, making artificial flowers and toys that were then sent to different places in the German Reich. In November of 1944, after surviving for two years in Theresienstadt, Margaret was in charge of a group of workers making teddy bears that were being sent to the families of German soldiers. It was in that, at that time that she got notification that she and her children would be placed on the next deportation out, out of Theresienstadt. Aware that deportation likely meant death, she went to her supervisor, a fellow Jew, and told him that if she was deported, then the quota of teddy bears would not be met. He then went to the German officer in charge and told him, according to Michael's later testimony, if you want these teddy bears, you better pull this lady off the transport. The move paid off. 
The officer signed a slip of paper that excused Margaret, Marietta, and Michael from that deportation, expecting, of course, that they would just get on the next deportation. But no other deportations were held before the Russians liberated the camp the following spring. Delaying her family's deportation, in this case, just this one time, ended up saving their lives. So that's the background for this painting by Marietta. You can see her here, her faint signature on this watercolor. There, were, there was uh, quite a lot of research done to find out if who made this. And uh, there's this faint signature. Here's a zoomed in view of her signature with the contrast changed to really make it much more visible. Marietta had watched her family's possessions been ripped away from them. She had lived through her father's murder and been forced to move into the crowded camp of Theresienstadt where she was surrounded by death. The watercolor by Marietta is one of several pieces of art that were included in an album that Margaret, Marietta's mother, created in the immediate aftermath of the war and which Michael, her brother, safeguarded over the following years and later donated to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. This piece, like much of the art done by children in Theresienstadt, captures some hints of the violence that surrounded Marietta with blood on the man's face and a lightning bolt carving down through the sky in the background. This is a, another piece of children's art that we show in our gallery that was saved by Michael Grunbaum. A lightning bolt appears here too, much like in Marietta's piece, although in this case wielded as a weapon in the battle against a far smaller adversary. The poem that's written in hand, in the, on this piece translates as, as you can see, further and further, always further, the battle for the light for life pierces the armor. Don't worry about thunder, accept the blows as they come closer and closer, do not give in. And it's signed by a fellow child, a fellow boy who was in the dormitory with Michael Peter Gans. The fact that children in Theresienstadt were able to make art may seem surprising, particularly when we think of conditions in Auschwitz or, or other camps. But Theresienstadt was a strange combination of work camp and ghetto, somewhat similar to the other ghettos of Lodz or Warsaw before they were uh, liquidated or emptied. And in Theresienstadt, like in those ghettos, the Jewish residents tried to sustain the arts and their rich culture, regardless of the depredation that they lived through. Theresienstadt was also somewhat unique because it was where many of the most well-educated German Jews were sent, including musicians, painters, poets, teachers, and writers. This population helped enrich the cultural life of the ghetto, composing and performing musical pieces, holding religious observances, and offering a series of open and secret art classes for children. Since the end of the war, the children's paintings from Theresienstadt, like this one by Marietta Grunbaum, have captured much public attention. In addition to the intrinsic value of the art, some of the works capture perspectives of life in the ghetto and offer a source of information about living conditions at a time when the only other images were publicity pieces by the Nazis. Somebody's asking, do I know how common the image of thunder is in people's drawings or writing from the Holocaust? An interesting thing. I mean, obviously, it's in these children's paintings and, and a number of others. I don't know, though, kind of statistically, if it's a, a common occurrence. I know it's just in ours. Um, from a larger perspective, the fact that both children and their teachers, despite the constant fear of death and deportation, continued to teach to paint, to learn, and to hope shows a level of courage and an inner strength that's often forgotten in the larger history of the Holocaust. The children's art is very much a product of resistance from a community that sought to sustain life even as they witnessed death all around them. While luck certainly helped save Margaret and her children, the optimism, hope, and willingness to resist, which we see in Marietta's painting, those were also factors, and those attributes also served Marietta well after the war. In 1947, Marietta, then 21, came to the United States with the assistance of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee 
and a B'nai B'rith scholarship to study at the University of Wisconsin. She completed her undergraduate degree and a master's degree in French. She also met her future husband at Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin, and moved together to Ohio, where she taught for 25 years at Denison University and raised two sons. She died in 2008 at the age of 81. Her brother, Michael, and her mother, Margaret, initially remained in Prague. But following the communist takeover in 1948, they headed to Paris and then flew to Cuba to wait permission to enter the United States legally. This picture shows them in Prague in 1948, shortly before leaving the city to head to Paris. Michael, who was 18 when he arrived in Cuba, earned a high school degree in two years at the American High School in Havana. They then received their visas and immigrated to the United States, arriving in New York Harbor by ship on July 4th, 1950. Michael later recalled that as they sailed into the harbor, there was this festive atmosphere with boats spraying shows of water, all of which he assumed was part of the regular welcoming ceremony for boats like his that was arriving. Later, of course, he arrived, he realized it was part of the July 4th celebrations. Michael went on to study at MIT, served for two years in the American Army during the Korean War, and then earned a graduate degree at Yale. He got married and eventually raised three sons. In 2015, he published a memoir describing his childhood in Theresienstadt entitled, Somewhere There Is Still a Son. The title captures the optimism and hope that's also present in his sister's art. Let me close by saying, how rare it was for children like Marietta and Michael to survive. During the period from 1941 to 1945, approximately 15,000 children were sent to Theresienstadt. 90% of them were killed. And overall, we know the Nazis murdered one and a half million children, reflecting the Nazi ideology blind to the fact that uh, even a basic level of humanity that children maybe and deserved some different treatment or, or were innocent of any crime. In addition to having a children's gallery where our museum explores the way the Holocaust impacted the youngest members of society, HMTC opened a children's garden back in 1998, which we renovated actually at the beginning of last year. I encourage you to come and see our garden Come see some of the signage and markers we have erected to honor the one and a half million children who were killed by the Nazis. And perhaps also come into the building and see this painting and the other materials in our exhibition. Okay, I will stop there. And uh, if you have questions, I see some have come in, type them in the Q&A box. Before I get to them, let me just mention a few other upcoming programs. Tomorrow, March 25th at 3 p.m., we're holding our first children's storybook program designed for children three to seven years of age. In this first program, Holocaust survivor Marie Taub is going to be reading The Day the Crayons Quit by Drew Daywalt. Next Wednesday at noon, I'll be back for the last of my Women's History Month Curator's Corners talking about Holocaust survivor and resistance fighter Vladka Mead, who's memorialized in HMTC's uh, Children's Memorial Garden. And one more program to mention on Thursday, April 8th, at noon, HMTC is holding its annual Yom HaShoah commemoration. I hope you'll join us for this virtual program to honor the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. You can find, as always, a full list of our programs on our website <clears throat> at www.hmtcli.org. And I hope you'll also consider going to our website and making a donation by clicking on the Give Now button. Okay. Thank you. Let's take a look at some of those questions. Did the Nazis allow the creation of art or did the Jews do this covertly? Also, how did the Jews get the art supplies? Yeah, so um, it's a mixture, Frank. The, uh, the Nazis did allow some activities in Theresienstadt and look the other way or didn't feel like it was a problem, but there was a number of, of art classes and other activities in Theresienstadt that were done secretly uh, because of concern about what the Nazis might do. So the, it's a combination of bo both. And as to the art supplies, um, 
They had stuff that was sent, you know, they would ask for care packages and things that were mailed to them. And the Nazis allowed Not sure what happened there. I hope I'm back. Um, I guess we just had maybe a, a little drop in our um, in our internet, but I think I'm back on. So uh, I will just continue with some of the questions. So as I said, it was part of a, the effort to sustain the myth of what was going on in Theresienstadt. How were deportations decided? Was it random or according to some kind of status? Uh, I'm not sure how that was done. I don't believe, I don't know if there was a Judenrat in Theresienstadt that was making those decisions. That may have been the case, uh, or it might have been the Nazis. I don't know, Frank. I'll have to look that up. Uh, prominent Jewish leaders like Rabbi Leo Beck led cultural and religious resistance. Could you elaborate on this a little? Yeah, as I said, I mean, there was, in Theresienstadt, there were religious services held. This is something I think that you found actually in a lot of the ghettos and even in the camps that one of the common ways Jews resisted was by sustaining their religious traditions and beliefs. Uh, I know of cases in, even in Auschwitz where Jewish holidays were celebrated, where people gathered and they found some way to gather and uh, would celebrate um, major holidays. And, and this, this was certainly a way to fight back. It might not have been with violence, but it was an important way to sustain Jewish culture, Jewish hope, uh, and the Jewish traditions during the war. Okay, well, thanks very much for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you at our other program soon and wish you all a very nice day. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everybody.